This video is brought to you by Structural Central. Visit StructuralCentral.com to quickly generate structural engineering calculations like those discussed here. Hello engineers. Today I'm going to show you how to determine the stress in a weld that is eccentrically loaded. Eccentric loading of welds comes up frequently in steel connection design. Anytime you have a load that does not pass through the centroid of a weld, eccentricity must be considered. This means nearly all welds made for simple shear connections must be designed for eccentricity. For example, double angle, single angle, and T connections all have C-shaped welds at the beam. The eccentricity for these cases is the distance from the weld group centroid to the face of the support. It's pretty clear that weld group eccentricity plays an essential role in the design of steel connections, so you're going to want to understand how it works. Now let's get into it. Say you have a weld that is supporting a concentric load which is when the load is being applied directly through the centroid of the weld. Determining the stress at any point in the weld is easy, since it is the same at all locations. Things get a lot more complicated though when eccentricity is introduced. Since the load no longer passes through the centroid, a torque or moment is being applied, which the welds will also have to resist. This eccentric loading will result in a stress profile that varies in magnitude and direction all along the length of the weld. There are two methods for determining the stress in the weld the elastic method, and the instantaneous center of rotation method. I'm going to show you how to do both methods. First, we'll start with the elastic method. The elastic method works by assuming the weld behaves linear elastically, which means that the stress in the weld is proportional to its deformation. This linear relationship makes it possible to use the principle of superposition to determine the stress. This allows you to split up the eccentric load into a concentric load and a concentrated moment. You can then determine the stress for these loads using simple formulas and then add the stresses together. We're going to walk through how this is done. As we already mentioned, for a concentric load, the stress in the weld is the same at all locations, so the reaction force per unit length R is just the load P divided by the total length of the weld L. The reaction will be in the opposite direction of the applied load so that equilibrium is reached. Now we'll move on to the concentrated moment. For this type of loading, the key principle is that the magnitude of the reaction force per unit length R at any point along the weld is proportional to its distance from the centroid of the weld C. This makes sense since the weld will be rotating around the centroid, so the further a point is from the centroid, the more deformation it will see due to the rotation. The direction of the reaction at each point will then be perpendicular to a line going from the centroid to that point. Equilibrium will be met when the moment from all of the reactions from every point along the weld is equal to the applied concentrated moment. Determining the reactions at every point in order to satisfy these requirements may sound complicated, but the formulas are actually pretty straightforward. The reaction per unit length R at any point along the weld is equal to the concentrated moment M times the distance from that point to the centroid C divided by the polar moment of inertia IP. The polar moment of inertia for the bulk group IP can be determined by adding the moment of inertia about the horizontal axis Ix to the moment of inertia about the vertical axis Iy. Now determining the moment of inertias for the weld requires a short discussion. For a rectangle, the moment of inertia about an axis is equal to the base times the height cubed over 12 plus the base times the height times the distance from the centroid squared. The first term is for the moment about an axis through the rectangle centroid and the second term is the adjustment for the actual axis location for the parallel axis theorem. For welds, the moment of inertia is determined the same way, except that the aspect ratio is so extreme that the calculation can be done as thickness independent, which means the welds get treated as lines instead of areas. For a vertical weld, this is done by removing B from each term, which changes the result to be in inches to the fourth per inch. For horizontal weld, you remove H from each term. Since the first term includes a very small variable squared, it can be considered to be negligible and be removed from the equation. To get the moment of inertia for a more complicated shape, you can break the shape up into pieces, determine the moment of inertia for each piece, then add them all together. Now that you know how to determine the moment of inertias, you can determine the reaction at any point in the weld due to the concentrated moment. Since this reaction will need to be combined with the reactions from the concentric load, it will be useful to split it up into its x and y components, which you can do by using these similar equations to determine each component of the reaction directly. Now that you have the reactions from the concentric load and from the concentrated moment, 
You just add the components together to determine the stress at any location of the weld. Now we'll move on to the other method, which is the instantaneous center of rotation method. This method differs from the elastic method in that it takes into account the actual nonlinear behavior of the weld. This allows the weld to share the load more through load redistribution. This method is less conservative than the elastic method, but it is also considered to be more accurate. Determining the results, though, is much more challenging since it can only be solved iteratively. For this method, the weld uses curved load deformation relationships like the one shown on the graph. The weld reaches its maximum possible reaction at a deformation equal to delta M, and it ruptures once it reaches delta U. The formula for delta U includes a cap of 0.17 times the weld thickness W in order to simplify computations. The shape of the load deformation curve means that the parts of the weld that have small deformations due to their location can still end up with significant reactions. For example, a part of the weld with a deformation of just 50% of delta M has a reaction that is 91% of its maximum reaction. An additional complication for welds is that the load deformation relationship depends on the angle of the load relative to the angle of the weld. When the longitudinal axis of the weld is parallel to the load, it is very ductile. As the load angle changes, the maximum reaction increases, but ductility is lost. The formula for the curves can be found in AISC's Steel Construction Manual. The stress in a weld FW is equal to this term, which is the strength of a fillet weld, including the adjustment for the angle between the load and the weld theta, times this term, which is a formula for a parabola, which will result in some value between 0 and 1, depending on the value P. P is the deformation of the weld delta, divided by the deformation that results in the maximum reaction, delta M. A p-value less than 1 means the weld has not yet reached its peak reaction, and a p-value greater than 1 means it has already reached the peak and its reaction is starting to decrease. Since this method uses nonlinear equations, superposition is not permitted. This means you'll need to determine the weld reactions that will result in equilibrium in the x-direction, y-direction, and in rotation all at the same time. The weld reactions follow a similar principle as the elastic method loaded with a concentrated moment. The deformation in each part of the weld is proportional to its distance from the point of rotation. How it differs, though, is that the point of rotation, or instantaneous center, is not known. For the elastic method, the point of rotation is always at the centroid. For the instantaneous center of rotation method, the point of rotation can be located anywhere depending on how eccentric the applied load is. High eccentricities result in the instantaneous center being located close to the centroid, and low eccentricities result in the instantaneous center being located very far away. The process for finding the location of the instantaneous center requires doing many iterations. You start off by picking some location as your initial guess. Since the ultimate deformation depends on the angle of the weld relative to its reaction, rupture may occur at any point along the weld. So you split up the weld into many segments and evaluate each segment individually. Here I am only using 8 segments just to show how this is done, but it is recommended that you use at least 20 segments for the longest section of the weld. The critical segment will be the one that reaches its ultimate deformation delta U first. When the weld rotates around the instantaneous center, the deformations will be proportional to the distance from the instantaneous center C, so the critical segment will be the one with the smallest delta U over C value. The deformation of all other segments will be scaled relative to the critical segment's deformation, so just multiply the minimum delta U over C by the segment's C value. Now that you've determined the deformation of each weld segment, you can then determine the stress in each weld segment by using the previously discussed formulas, which are shown again below for reference. You can then determine the reaction at each segment by multiplying the weld stress, Fw, by the area of the weld, which is 0.707 times the weld leg size, W, and the length of the weld segment, L. Next, you determine the x and y components of the reactions and the resulting moment about the instantaneous center using the formula shown. You then add up all the forces to see if the weld segment reactions have the same ratio of moment and shear as the applied load. For our initial guess, the weld can support an ultimate load in the y direction of 1.2 kips. If this load was applied where our actual load is being applied, this would result in a moment about the instantaneous center of negative 10 inch kips. This is not opposite and equal to the moment from the weld segment reactions about the instantaneous center. Our initial guess for the instantaneous center was not correct, so we must try again. It will take many guesses before you find the correct location. You'll need to determine which direction to move the instantaneous center, 
and then figure out how far to move it. This process requires many calculations, so it should be done using a spreadsheet where you can quickly guess new instantaneous center locations, or you can use software that is capable of finding the instantaneous center location for you automatically. Once the applied moment and the moment from the weld segment reactions result in equilibrium, the instantaneous center location guess is correct, and so the weld stresses you calculated for that location will be the actual weld stresses when the ultimate load is applied. If you would like to easily create weld stress calculations like those discussed here, visit StructuralCentral.com. There you will be able to quickly generate structural engineering calculations just by entering a few inputs. With its intuitive interface and live updating, you will be able to start getting results immediately. Select the weld pattern, then enter the dimensions directly on the drawing and see all of the reactions right there. Provide the weld size and the program will also determine the weld capacity and check its stress ratio. The calculations are well referenced with values plugged in, just like you would write by hand. You can also move the mouse over the variables to see a description of what they are and see all other instances where they are used, making calculation review a breeze. Head on over to StructuralCentral.com and sign up for free today.